just leaving Great Yarmouth on this small fishing boat, the Sea Venture. We're heading about three and a half, four miles out to sea to fish for Dover Sole. Now, it's been hard for fishermen over the past few years, what with quotas and the decline in fish stocks. But fishermen of this coast say their real problem has been dredgers. Dredgers are really industrial hoovers. They suck up gravel and sand from the seabed for use as building materials. We're heading off Lowestoft, south of the dredging grounds, because we can't fish for Dover Sole where they're dredging because of the disturbance they make. They're frightening the fish away, and we're only left to work where we can go clear dredges. The shallow waters off Great Yarmouth used to be rich in cod and skate, but fish are becoming more scarce, and the fishermen blame dredging. They say churning up the seabed has destroyed fish's feeding grounds, and that as the amount of dredging has increased, so the amount of fish has decreased. We've seen our fishing grounds slowly pinched from us by ever encroaching further eastwards. When dredging first started off, we, we, we lived with it. We went further and outside of these dredges. But slowly they acquired more dredging area, more dredging area. We're now to a point where we're 12 miles to sea before we can get clear of them. And in 30-foot boats during the winter, that's not safe. That's not good. And we're slowly being forced out of business by it. The fish visit the area to feed up, to build up to spawn. They've taken all the top layers of the seabed away. When they come here, there's no food left for them. They come here and they're gone in 12 hours, and if we aren't there at the particular time they move through the area, we missed them. There's no sustainable food there for them. We see it as a strip mine desert. They've taken away all the topsoil and left nothing. This dredger's operating eight miles off Yarmouth, in the middle of what used to be a favourite fishing ground. It uses a giant vacuum pipe to suck up sand and gravel. But studies have shown that in the process, it also takes up worms and the small shellfish, which are the base of the marine food chain. The industry acknowledges there is some short-term damage, but insists only a tiny area of the seabed is affected. It's true to say that when we're actually dredging, there is an effect on marine life. However, because we're dredging only a small area, that effect is closely contained. Secondly, independent research has shown that the dredging grounds very quickly recover. The marine life very rapidly returns to them within almost three years, really. This is just one of the dredgers which works around here. Now, they have to be licensed, but there are five companies which have permission to work in this area. Bearing in mind that each one of these ships can suck up thousands of tonnes of sand and gravel in just a few hours, that makes this area one of the most intensively dredged areas off the British coast. Dredging's a growing industry. In the 1950s, there were just a handful of areas in the Bristol Channel which were licensed for dredging. Now, there are more than 70 dredging grounds along the east coast and around the rest of the British coastline. There are also applications to dredge 30 new areas which are currently being considered. Dredging licenses are granted by the Crown Estate, a government department. Critics say it isn't impartial, as dredging companies pay for the licenses, and so last year they made the Crown Estate £13 million. Most of the gravel and sand is used for building in Britain, but as production has risen, so have exports. Norfolk gravel was used to build Schiphol Airport near Amsterdam. Holland has brought in strict new controls on dredging to protect its own seabed. Now, councils along the East Anglian coast want similar controls here. Hemsby Beach is now probably as famous for its stones as for anything else, but they used to be covered by sand. In fact, if I'd have been standing here ten years ago, behind me, where the sea now is, there would be a range of sand dunes. This coast is eroding, but local people think it's eroding more quickly because of the dredging. Pat Gowan's been coming here all his life. His study of the beach has convinced him that dredging's destroying it. Prior to the time that dredging started, this beach was acricating. It was growing and getting bigger, and we were getting further from the sea. But soon after dredging started, the beach started to diminish. Great cuts were occurring, such as you'll probably see behind me here. We've lost, oh, I would say, about 118 metres of dune here since dredging started. The dredging companies point out that some eroded beaches have actually been restored using sand they've dredged from the seabed. Far from being part of the problem, they see themselves as part of the solution. Well, there's really a mountain of research that shows that dredging is not causing coastal erosion. Um, 
there are many studies that take place before the dredging is allowed and one of those is what we call a coastal impact study where independent scientists are able to advise the government on the potential effects of the extraction. In the case of the licenses off Great Yarmouth, they're located many miles from the coast in water depths of between about 100 and 150 feet uh, and in those depths of water uh, the scientists believe that the dredging is environmentally acceptable. Mr Gowan doesn't accept that. He has a vested interest though. Twelve years ago, his holiday home disappeared. That saw our old bungalow risk it in 1985, well up on the beach. That is what happened in 1988, following offshore dredging, deposited on the beach. And that's the last we saw of it, being washed away by the sea. If they continue as, as is, we're going to lose a considerable amount of Norfolk because in many places there's nothing more than just these undefended marum hills between them and the sea, and many are below sea level. In a statement to Countryfile, the DETR said all dredging proposals are subjected to a full environmental impact assessment and to wide consultation with all fishing and other local interest groups. I think this is just wholesale strip mining. I think what you're doing is just taking everything, nobody can see what you're doing, and, and that, that ain't right. I don't think that's right, because I don't think the environment have been considered at all. There are plans to introduce tighter controls on dredging companies when new licences are issued. The companies insist they already take environmental concerns into consideration. But the fishermen off Great Yarmouth say that without radical limits on the industry, both sea life and the seashore remain in danger. Streams of storm and tide have shaped our coastline. We try to hold the sea back with walls of concrete. But in 1953, disaster struck. The sea broke through our defences along the east coast of England. A massive tide left a trail of devastation. Hundreds of people drowned and many thousands saw their homes destroyed. Our response was to rapidly rebuild the sea walls, making them stronger than ever before. But are we now safe from the sea? The danger for places like Sea Pauling, lying at or below sea level, is ever present. Only this week, a high tide backed by a northwesterly sent the sea over defences like these further up the coast. The National Rivers Authority spend £50 million a year repairing and bolstering our sea defences. But walls only stretch as far and as high as money will allow. A sea wall like you see behind you can cost up to £7,000 a metre, £7 million pounds, uh, a kilometre. It's very expensive. The works that we're doing at the moment are to protect these defences and to raise beach levels so that the life expectancy of these defences, which can be a minimum of 50 years, are realised. The NRA are trying to hold the line, replacing old groins and sinking offshore reefs to break up the power of the waves, bringing in sand to build up worn away beaches. Rising seas pound our slowly sinking coastline and the sea walls are being undermined. The battle to hold back the North Sea is constant and expensive. Brand new defences like these at Eccles in Norfolk are all that stand between the people and land on the other side and all this. But instead of spending millions to keep it at bay, the idea now is to stage a managed retreat and let the sea have her way. The NRA are fighting natural forces on the coast, but market forces may settle the argument. New Ministry of Agriculture proposals give urban areas top priority. Last year, 85% of available money went on the top three categories. Rural coastal areas must make do with what's left, but the plan is to go one step further. Most of our coast is a tidal flood area. There is now a secret hit list of 40 sites, mostly around North Norfolk and the Essex marshes, where land could be given back to the sea.